And welcome to the Meltdown Festival at the South Bank Center. I'm Aaron Rosenblum, the producer of Young Gene Lee's Theatre Company. Tonight's performance of We're Gonna Die was originally written for 13P, which was a collective of 13 playwrights who were devoted to realizing full productions of each of their plays. Now that they have done all 13 plays, 13P has imploded. This was number 11. Please turn off your cell phones and do not film or photograph anything. And now, we're gonna die. When I was growing up, my mother used to always try to scare my sister and me by saying, you better behave or you're gonna end up like your Uncle John. And this was actually a pretty effective threat because my Uncle John is the most isolated person I've ever known. Uh, he's always lived alone. He doesn't have a single friend. Um, as far as anyone knows, he's still a virgin. And for as long as I can remember, he has spent every major holiday with my family. And it's this terrible paradox because on the one hand, uh, we all feel really sorry for my Uncle John and for how lonely he is. Uh, but on the other hand, none of us really wants to be around him either. He smells bad, he's rude. Um, whenever he comes over, he just kind of sits there and lets everyone wait on him. And he's always had this weirdly lethargic quality. Um, I remember when I was growing up, I used to always ask him, Uncle John, do you want to play with me? And he would always respond, why don't we just sit here and rest? So when I was 12, I decided that I wanted to see what my Uncle John was like in a more animated state. So one night when he was brushing his teeth before going to sleep, um, I snuck into his room and I hid under his bed. And my plan was that when he went to get into the bed, I was gonna grab his ankles and give him a little surprise. So I'm under my Uncle John's bed waiting for him to come back from brushing his teeth and um, when he comes back into the room, instead of going right to bed, he goes and he sits down at a little desk that's in the room. And I heard him start to mutter something to himself. And he was muttering it over and over. And at first I couldn't understand what he was saying, but then he started to get louder and louder. And I heard that what he was saying was, I'm a piece of shit, I'm a piece of shit, I'm shit, I'm shit, I'm shit. Just over and over again. And then he started to cry. And I was under his bed. <laughs> Obviously, I couldn't do the ankle grabbing thing anymore. <laughs> so I, you know, I just sort of started to panic. You know, like I didn't know how much longer I was going to be stuck under there. And all the while, my Uncle John is just saying, I'm a piece of shit, piece of shit, and crying. Until suddenly, he stopped. And I heard a loud snore. Um, he had fallen asleep at the desk. And as I got the hell out of there, I remember wondering to myself if this was how my Uncle John fell asleep every night. Looking back on that story now, the thing that strikes me the most is the fact that even my Uncle John, you know, weird Uncle John, had a public face that he put on to cover up the true extent of his suffering. Um, and when you're younger, it's sort of, you know, more okay to cry and freak out when you're upset. Um, but the older you get, the more necessary it becomes to develop this public face that you put on to hide your pain. And it's not even like you can rip off the mask and let it all hang out when you're in private around people who care about you, because there's only so long you can go on dumping your pain on other people before eventually they start to get fed up. Which can make being in pain an incredibly lonely experience. Now this is something that has always really bothered me a lot. And I always wished that there was some form of comfort available to us so that when we were in that isolated place of pain, there would be something to make us feel better and not so alone. And I always imagined that if I found that comfort, it would take the form of something big and revelatory and amazing. Um, but when I have encountered actual comfort in my life, it's never been anything like that. Um, it's always been something very ordinary and common sense. For example, there's this thing that my mother said to me when I was six years old and I was experiencing that awful alone in pain feeling for the very first time. At the time I had two best friends and their names were Emily and Jenny and they were sisters who lived across the street. 
And my favorite memory of Emily and Jenny is this one time when they came over and their grandparents had bought them bicycles. Um, neither of our families had any money, so this was a really big deal. And um, I remember I didn't have a bicycle, so I remember just running alongside Emily and Jenny as they rode their bikes down the street, you know, until eventually they would overtake me. And then I would turn around and walk home and wait for them to come back so that I could run alongside again. And I just did this over and over again. Until, finally, Emily turned to me and said, hey, why don't we teach you how to ride a bike so that you can take a turn? And I was so excited. But it turns out that learning how to ride a bike from six-year-olds is not the best idea. Um, I was bleeding from every joint, and um, I couldn't go inside and get cleaned up because if my mother had seen me, uh, she would have freaked out and made me stop. And at this point, all I wanted out of life was to be able to ride a bicycle. So I kept at it, becoming increasingly injured, and um, eventually I, I, I got to the point where I could do it. I could ride the bike. So Emily volunteered to be the one to chase after, and um, she saw me covered in blood, and she got inspired. And she said, hey, why don't we pretend that I'm an advertising executive? For some reason, Emily always wanted to be an advertising executive. I don't think she even knew what it was. But she said, I'm an advertising executive, and you have just murdered my husband. And that's why you're covered in blood, and now you are trying to escape on your bicycles. So Jenny and I rode off down the street um, with Emily chasing us, you know, screaming, murderers, you murdered my husband. And uh, Jenny and I were like, ha, 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 you'll never see your husband again. And um, we called that game murder, and we played it all the time after that. About a year later, a new girl moved into the neighborhood, and her name was Mary DiDio. And uh, Mary started to play with us, and eventually it got to the point where she was playing with Emily and Jenny, and I wasn't invited. And um, finally, one day at school during recess, um, the three of them were playing, and I walked up to them, and they all kind of looked at each other, and then Emily said, one, two, three, go. And they all just ran away from me as fast as they could. And it was very clear that I was not supposed to chase them. I remember going to the nurse's office and telling her that I had a stomach ache and um, she let me lie down on a little cot that was in the room and then I started to cry so she thought I was really sick and she called my mother to come pick me up. That night, as I was lying in bed, for the first time in my life I experienced the feeling of not being able to fall asleep. And I remember I had this tiny little attic bedroom with these two little windows right above my bed and uh, I remember staring at the branches through the windows for a really long time. And eventually my mother came in to check on me and I told her that I couldn't sleep. And this is what she said to me. In the dead of the night with your eyes open wide, you will sleep by and by, by and by. All alone in the dark, with the pain in your heart, you will sleep by and by, by and by. Wait for the dawn. Sleep won't come If you don't sleep tonight It's alright, it's alright You will sleep by and by, by and by
enough And your body gives up You will sleep by and by By and by Fast asleep in your bed Not a thought in your head You will sleep by and by By and by You are That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Like I said, it's not some big profound thing, but I feel like it's better than nothing. So that's the sort of thing that I would like to share with you tonight. Just some sort of ordinary comforting things that have somehow helped me to feel a little better when I was in that lonely, isolated place. And I'm sharing them with you in the hopes that they might help you to feel less alone when you're in pain, uh, which I hope you're not. Okay, so. A lot of people think that the best way to not feel alone is to find romance. But as most of you probably know, there are some problems with that. Uh, one of the biggest ones being that not everyone can find it. Um, I didn't find romance until after I had graduated from college. Um, when I was in high school, I didn't date at all. And when I was in college, I dated a series of alcoholics, um, none of whom were my boyfriend, which I knew because they would all tell me, you're not my girlfriend. But, um, you know, but then I graduated from college and I sort of started to get my life together and I met this wonderful guy named Henry. Uh, Henry was smart, he was funny, he was really nice to me and um, when we had been dating for about a year, we moved in together. And it was around this time that my parents decided to host this big family reunion at their house. And I was really excited because I'd always sort of been the black sheep of the family. Um, I had an older sister who had always been very successful and popular. And yet even she had never brought home a guy as wonderful as Henry. So I was very eager to bring him home and show him off. So we went to the reunion and um, it was great. You know, everyone was really impressed by Henry, like almost to an offensive extent. I was like, is it really that amazing that I managed to find a good boyfriend? Um, but it was great. And, um, and I remember all the cousins were playing softball in the backyard the way that we used to when we were kids. And the ball rolled into the bushes by the kitchen door and I went to go get it. And the kitchen door was open and my mother was in the kitchen with one of my aunts. And I heard my mother tell her sister that she could never feel the same way about me as she did about my, my sister. And um, that night, uh, I told Henry what had happened, and um, he was really nice about it. Uh, but he was an only child, so he didn't really understand, and then he fell asleep. And as I was lying there, this is what I thought to myself. When life deals me a blow and I'm reeling in pain I try to comfort me but it doesn't go away You tell me that you love me before you fall asleep And as I lie awake with my worries on repeat I try to think of something that will ease my grief And the answer comes right to me as I listen to you breathe I still have you, you're in my bed I hold my hand until I'm dead If you die first I'll be alone But until then I'll have a home Last night I had a dream That I'd lost my mind I woke up in a panic 
of overwhelming fright. I realized how close we are to madness and despair. The truth of my own weakness was more than I could bear. But then I saw you next to me when I turned on the light. I reached for you and in your sleep you held me tight. I still have you. You're in my bed. You'll hold my hand until I'm dead. If you die first, I'll be alone. But until then, I'll have a home Today you were so miserable And anxious all day long It's been that kind of week When everything goes wrong You don't deserve the things That have been happening to you I want to make them go away But what can I do? I try to cheer you up But I can't fix anything Life is what it is All I can do is sing You still have me I'm in your bed I'll hold your hand until you're dead. If I die first, you'll be alone. But until then, you'll have a home. You'll have a home. So, of course, a year later, Henry dumped me. It was one of those awful things where you sense the person pulling away, so you cling on even more desperately, and it goes on for way too long, and it's horrible, and eventually he had to pull the plug. On the day that he moved out, um, uh, I said that I was gonna go to a friend's house because uh, it would be too painful for me to see him move out all his things, and um, before he left, I made him promise that he would rearrange all the furniture before he left so that there wouldn't be all of these big gaps where all of his things used to be, because I said it would just be too painful for me to walk in and have to see that. So Henry promised that he would do this for me, and I went to my friend's house, and when I came back later that night, um, I opened the door, and I saw that Henry had rearranged everything perfectly. Um, he had even swept so that there were no marks where any of his things used to be. The only problem was that he had had this giant widescreen television that had been the focal point of our living room. And, um, you know, obviously he had taken it with him because it was his. And on this big table where the television used to be, he had put a doily and two candlesticks. <laughs> and I just saw that and burst into tears. And I ran into the bedroom and saw that half the books were missing from the shelves. And that's when it hit me. Now I live here alone.
cousin's wedding and while I was at home uh, I found my first white hair um, and I had never been somebody who worried at all about you know getting older or losing my looks I just never thought about that stuff um, so it all just kind of hit me in this one moment and I had this major overreaction and I realized that if my whole life had been this upward climb through learning how to walk and talk and read and get better at things and stronger that I had reached the point in my life where everything from here on out was going to be a downward decline into deterioration and sickness and death. And this had never occurred to me before, so I was really traumatized. Uh, I remember going into my mother's room and showing her the white hair, and I told her that I was freaking out. And um, she told me something that her grandmother once said to her. So in this next song, you are going to be seeing your first impersonation of the evening, and it's going to be a triple impersonation. David will be doing my impersonation of my mother's impersonation of her grandmother. My mother's mother lived to be a hundred She died when I was just a little child Before she passed, she called me to her deathbed She pulled me close, this is what she said When you get old, you will lose your mind And everything will hurt all the time I cried and started calling for my mother My mother's mother gripped me with her claw She said, be quiet, child Stop your fussing There's something more When you get old All your friends will die And you will be a burden to the world
my hair and spoke into my ear. Getting old for me has been a blessing. Now I face death with little fear. If we got old and we were strong and healthy, we would My father was a very healthy person. He ate healthy, he exercised, he never smoked a day in his life. And when he turned 60, he was diagnosed with advanced stage lung cancer and told that he had a year and a half left to live. Because he was so healthy, um, he managed to survive chemo for three years and he worked the whole time. He was amazing. So one day, my dad goes to the doctor and the doctor tells him that there is a clinical trial for a new miracle drug for lung cancer patients. And this drug is so crazily effective that in some patients, they see a shrinkage in their cancer the very next day after taking the drug. The only catch is that the drug is only effective in the less than 2% of the population who have a very rare genetic mutation. But if you're one of that 2%, then this drug can save your life. The clinic where the trial was being held was about a six hour drive from where my parents lived. And my father was not in great shape to travel, but um, they made the trip. And uh, my dad went through two days of really intensive testing to find out if he had the mutation. Um, and uh, you know, when they were done with the tests, they came back home and they waited for a month for the results. And the whole time they were waiting, they were scared that you know, even the, if the results came back positive and my father was eligible, that he would be too sick to make the trip back to the clinic for the trial. But eventually the phone call came and unbelievably, my father was one of the 2%. He had the genetic mutation and he was just well enough to travel. So my parents made the trip back to the clinic and when they got there, the nurse looked really upset. And she said, I'm sorry, but there's been a mistake. And my parents started freaking out and she said, you know, no, no, you have the genetic mutation. You're totally eligible for this trial. The only problem is that one of the blood samples we took was too small. So unless we retake the blood sample and wait for another month for the results, we won't be able to use your results in the trial and therefore we cannot release this medication. My parents asked to speak to the doctor and they explained to the doctor that my father could not wait another month for um, the results to come back because um, he probably was not going to live that long. So, you know, could the doctor just please give them the medication to save my father's life? And the doctor felt terrible and he said, you know, I wish I could, but I would lose my license. Um, but what I can do is I can try to put a rush on the blood sample in the hopes that it will come back sooner than a month and you'll be able to take the medication. So my parents checked into a hotel and waited. And while they were at the hotel, my father's condition continued to decline to the point where he couldn't breathe at all lying on his back, like not even with an oxygen tank. So he would just sit up all night struggling to breathe. And eventually it got so bad that he had to go to a hospital and get a tube put down his throat so that he could breathe. And that was the day that I showed up. Um, my whole family was exhausted, so I took over for them at the hospital, and um, I remember my father was communicating by writing on a little notepad, and he and I worked out the system of hand signals that he would use to um, communicate with me so that I could tell the nurses what he wanted. That night, I was sleeping on a cot in my father's hospital room, and all of a sudden, all the alarms started going off, and um, the lights came on, the nurses came running into the room, and I got up and I saw my father sitting upright in the bed and um, his arms were strapped to the bed and he just had this expression on his face of such terror. 
Like, I have never seen a more horrible expression. And um, he was just, it was like, it reminded me of something out of one of those Renaissance paintings of hell. And he was just freaking out and doing everything in his power to get that tube out of his throat. And um, it took three nurses and me to um, restrain him to the point where they could sedate him again. After this happened, um, I turned to the nurses and I said, you know, what the hell was that? You know, my father was the calmest person. He would just never do that. And the nurses explained that sometimes when you give patients sedation, um, when they wake up, they don't know who they are or where they are. You know, all they know is that they're strapped to this scary bed with this horrible thing going down their throat and they panic. And the nurses said, you know, don't worry, it's totally normal. And this happened like five or six times over the course of the night. And I was getting so angry at the nurses. I just said, give him enough sedation so that you know, this doesn't keep happening to him and he doesn't keep waking up. And um, you know, the nurses felt bad and they said, you know, if we give him too much sedation, we're gonna kill him. You know, we're trying to do this very delicate balancing act. And then an even more horrible thought occurred to me, which was, you know, what if it's not even the case that he doesn't know who he is or where he is? You know, what if he just desperately wants to communicate something and that's why he wants the tube out of his throat? And um, I told this to the nurses and the nurses said, you know, even if that's the case, if we take the tube out, he'll die. So there's really nothing we can do. And this went on all night. The next morning, the Blood samples came back confirming my father as eligible for the trial, and that afternoon he died. After this happened, I was just so enraged. You know, just the perversity of that sequence of events, and my father was such a good person, and for him to die that way, and for me to see it, I just couldn't get over it. And um, I wasn't eating, I wasn't sleeping at all. If I did manage to fall asleep, I would have horrible nightmares, and then wake up with this feeling of dread that I was gonna die exactly the way my father did. And if anybody tried to help me, I would just get angrier and angrier, and nobody could do anything, until I got a letter from my friend Beth. Um, but before I tell you what Beth's letter said, um, I need to tell you a little bit about Beth, and before I do that, I need to get a drink of water. So when my friend Beth was about to turn 40, she had been married for 12 years to a really charming and successful guy. And they had two beautiful children, ages three and six, and they were all in the car on their way back from a weekend family outing. And uh, my friend Beth was driving, her husband was in the passenger seat, and the two kids were in the back. And uh, Beth's husband's cell phone was on the divider between them, and it rang and Beth looked down and saw that it was her husband's coworker, Anita, and her husband rejected the call. Beth asked, you know, why'd you reject that call from Anita? If she's calling on a weekend, maybe it's something important about work. And her husband gave her an answer that just didn't make any sense at all. And um, Beth thought this was weird, and it sort of continued to bother her all day. And um, that night, she was lying awake at two in the morning and it was still bothering her, this phone call. So she wakes up her husband and she says, look, I know there was something weird with that phone call today. You tell me right now what it is. And her husband gets up and he says, okay, I've been trying to figure out how to tell you this. I guess now is the time. Basically, for the past 12 years of their marriage, plus the four years they had been dating before that, this man had been sleeping with strippers, prostitutes, random women he'd met in bars. He said it was like over 100 women. And the first words out of Beth's mouth were, did you use condoms? And he responded, not usually. Um, but, he said, but, um, you were always the one who I loved. You know, those women, other women, they were just sex. You know, I always loved you. Until this woman, Anita, from work. They had been seeing each other for the past six months. Um, they were in love and Anita wanted to have a baby. So Beth's husband was gonna leave Beth and their children for this woman, Anita. Obviously, it's the night from hell. My friend Beth doesn't get any sleep. And um, the next morning, she's in the shower 
and in a total freak accident, she somehow manages to slip and fall, and in the process of falling, claws out her own cornea. True story. So after this happened, I was one of the people who helped um, to nurse Beth through the trauma of that experience. And um, since then, she had moved across the country. And when she heard about what had happened to my father, she wrote me a letter. And this is what the letter said. It's horrible what happened. And I'm sorry that you're suffering. You probably won't feel better for a while. Don't worry, I won't tell you to get on with your life. And I promise I won't try to make you smile. I don't know what you're going through, but I know what it's like to want to die when life insists on going on. And when I sing the little song that makes me feel a little better, just a little. Not a lot. Who do you think you are to be immune from tragedy? What makes you so special that you should go unscathed? It's horrible what happened, and I'm sorry that your mind is filled with all those agonizing memories. I regret that I can't help with words of comfort or reassuring expertise. But I know what it's like to cry. How could this have happened? Why on earth should I be cursed? That's when I sing a little song that makes me feel a little better. Just a little. Not a What makes you so special that you should go unscathed? I read Beth's letter, I asked myself, okay, so who do you think you are? And the answer was, I think I'm special. I believe deep down with all my heart that I deserve to be immune, not only from loneliness and tragedy, but also from aging, sickness, and death. 
but I'm not special. I'm a person. And when you're a person, all kinds of really terrible things can happen to you. That's why my father died the way he did. And if I die the same way, it'll be for the same reason, because I'm a person, just like my father, just like my uncle John, just like everyone. And again, it wasn't some big profound revelation, but for the first time in a long time, I felt a very little bit of comfort. We're gonna die. 